I advise that the meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of the meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect the cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they have continual importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. We have apologies from Councillor Hyde and Councillor Donovan. I seek a mover and a seconder, a seconder to move the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 2nd of March. And I take them as read and read, confirmed as accurate recording of the proceedings. Do I have Councillor Canole, a seconder? Councillor Sims, would you like to speak to him? Anyone else like to speak to him? Those in favour? Those against? The motion's carried. Thank you. Members, uh, staff and public gallery, uh, welcome to today. Tonight we're the strategic <coughs> discussion forum meeting of the committee. Members, while we are not debating the matter on the agenda tonight, this is your opportunity to provide feedback to administration. While the workshop is facilitated by our, administra our, admin our administration, sorry, please feel free to ask questions through the chair and you'll also be invited to respond to the key questions asked of you. If you have any further questions about the committee structure or process, please talk to Jenny offline so can we can proceed with the business before us. Yes, Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair. I will discuss it um, offline, but given we're about to move into the discussion, mm -hmm. uh, you did um, state in your preamble we're not able to engage in debate, but then at the same time you're asking for feedback. So how do you draw the distinction? How will you as Chair differentiate between debate and feedback? Well, I think with this, this has been explained many times, but I'll get Jenny to explain We've further for you. I still don't okay. understand it, that's why I'm Let's, let's, yeah. let's yeah. go again. Yeah, just want to make sure I don't make a mistake. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, members. It's a strategic discussion workshop, so I think the idea is for you to make comments. I think once you start entering into debate and perhaps arguing the merit or not of other people's comments, then you're probably entering into debate. It's probably um, easier if perhaps we call it out when it happens, but please feel free to have an open discussion. So just to clarify, we can give uh, feedback at our own views, but we can't respond to what someone else has said. What if that, what somebody else has said? Has All right, just to, be, just, to be, right, just to be clear, you can ask questions in relation to the matter before you. You can ask for clarification in regards to the matter before you. You can ask questions and give feedback, but you can't explain debate or what your thoughts are. Why in we, have it, we can't explain why we have a view. No, the idea is to these, these forums, these committees, and these workshops are for administration to receive feedback from you. They're not here to enter into any political debate with you. They're here to answer your questions. In order to have efficient meetings and in order for administra administration to receive clear advice and clear direction, we need to remain to the subject, to the point and directly onto the subject in regards to feedback and questions. Yes, Councillor Moran. Surely you can give direction to start without voting. Um, is an absolute abrogation um, of our duties. We make we give direction to administration in formal meetings. We yeah. don't give direction to our staff in these workshops. I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what this is about, and that's confusing all of us. Well, um, CEO, would you like to um, explain further on that? Thank you. I think the uh, thank you through the chair. The key point is this isn't decision making. So obviously tonight, um, what we would like to hear from you is your thoughts and suggestions. Um, and we do have key questions on the slides and obviously they've um, been distributed in advance. It really is about just hearing from you. This isn't decision making. So obviously after tonight, we take away the broad range of views that we will have heard from both, from all of you tonight. We then reflect on that. We might do some more research. We might um, uh, do some community engagement. And then we bring that back to you further down the track, either through committee or into the chamber for a decision. So tonight isn't about decision making. I think what the chair was saying is that um, she didn't hear your 
your thoughts and feedback on the information that's being presented. Councillor Martin, I'll see you have your hand up. We've done workshops for quite some time now. I'm surprised we're still getting confusion from people um, here tonight. So can we please start? I think the confusion is restored. The asking for well, a straw poll. As I, I said, I didn't hear those words, yeah. Councillor Moran. No, the, the, the questions for us to answer, we're basically putting our hand up. And, aren't we? I'd encourage you not to. I'd encourage you to share your thoughts in relation to those questions. We deliberately shape these questions to make sure it's not a straw poll answer that you give Councillor. Councillor Martin, if you have anything further today, you can take that offline. I would like to proceed with the meeting. Well, I, have a, I have a question. Um, sure. if, if we're not making decisions, but the administration is forming views as a consequence of the discussion, isn't that in breach of the Local Government Act, which requires a voting meeting for the administration to form a, a view and take action? Well, this is not a decision making. Committee. No, no, but it is for the administration. Not for it's not, it's not, not a decision making. That's absolutely not. So the administration won't be influenced by anything we say. No. Oh, as for the questions that are before you in the papers. Decision making. This is not decision making. This is for you to give your thoughts and ask any questions or give. You might have further direction that you would like administration to go with in regarding to the items but in closing the agenda. To what end, if the administration cannot, under the Local Government Act, change its course, to what end are we speaking? We, we haven't formalised a new development um, in relation to this item, so we're not changing course, we're sharing with you. You asked us to bring this in for a workshop, that's what we're doing, Councillor. Um, we have some content in there. This is a, um, in relation to this item, it is a difference in relation to how we have currently delivered our community development and sport and rec grant programs. We've got some ideas in here that we're sharing. We're here, keen to hear your thoughts. We haven't got a firm view. And obviously any changes to this come back for council decision making. This is a workshop. All right, thank you. We're gonna move on. Um, sorry, Chair. Oh, ask, sorry, Mr. Councillor Making. A question. Um, it's not been my observation over the last eight months that there's been a practice in this council of uh, occasional moments where standing orders have been moved to be suspended in order for a more fuller and informal discussion. Is that correct? Um, has there been in the, the earlier part of this council term any any practice uh, in that regard? Thank you, CEO. Uh, through the through the chair, yes, of course. So there are occasions where we have moved into what we call informal, which not, not then the suspends items. standing orders. Um, there hasn't necessarily been a practice of this council to do that. There has been in previous iterations. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Right, thank you. We're going to move on. Um, first item on the agenda: 4.1 Community yeah. Development yeah. Grants Review. Uh, Christy, would you like to introduce the item? Thank you. Through the Chair, hello members. Um, at a council meeting in June and subsequent workshop in September last year, uh, we made a commitment to return to you with a community grant guideline review. Having looked at the guidelines in detail, we realised that the value proposition for assessing these grants needs a new focus. So tonight, rather than reviewing the guidelines specifically, we've returned to you with a new community impact grant structure for discussion. Following tonight's feedback, we'll bring back a holistic picture and uh, including the guidelines for discussion. So Amy will take us through the slides very briefly just to focus us. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll um, just to flick through these have been provided, so I won't go into detail, but um, the key messages, as um, Christy said, um, these um, came from a decision of council. Uh, also, we have an audit report that we're responding to. Um, and just some opportunities with reshaping as well around realigning this, um, this work into one um, area. So these are the questions, I'll come back to those. Um, I'll take these as read. Um, so the key change is the development of what's called what we're calling a community impact um, grants program. So the key things is that we've combined the community development program and the sport and rec programs to make one. Um, you'll see there the total um, there is a variance, and we're proposing that that variance be used to create a strategic partnerships fund, um, which I'll get onto now. Or next, sorry. 
In the community impact grants, we're looking at changing the focus to be more um, focused on outcomes um, rather than what is being done. Um, and mainly the mechanisms have stayed much the same. Um, so the Strategic Partnership Fund is aimed to give uh, some more flexibility and um, to co-create, uh, I guess, initiatives with the community. So um, this is similar to what happens now currently around cultural um, partnerships. Um, so that's basically um, looking at that structure. And so here is where you see the 200K that was um, previously discussed. So our guiding principles, I'll take those as read there. This is the process. So as um, Christy said, we haven't brought back to you guidelines um, at this meeting, but we will. So when once we have the feedback um, from tonight, we'll go away, um, talk to our key stakeholders again, um, look at the guidelines, draft them, bring those back to council, to committee and council again, and for endorsement and then implementation from July 1. Here are the, count, the questions. Any feedback and questions, Councillor Sims? Uh, thanks, Chair. I might um, start with some feedback and uh, some questions and then move into feedback. Um, my first uh, question is, is this a reduction in the amount of money that's going to be made available in terms of grants? By rolling them into one, would we in effect be reducing the amount of money that's made available to community organisations? Uh, through the Chair, there is a variance of 46 thousand um, dollars so when we looked at realigning these we were obviously trying to balance um, the need obviously to continue to support community um, programs but also um, trying to as well provide a modest um, reduction in line with the economic climate so there'd be forty thousand dollars less for community grants under this under this approach through the chair, forty-six. Forty-six thousand dollars less. So it, it is being driven by a desire to try and reduce the amount of funding that's being made available. So you see, yeah. no, that's not the intent. Um, my understanding is that not all the funding has always been delivered. This is including the sport and rec grounds as well. So we haven't always spent all the money every year. Okay, fair, so fair enough. This isn't driven from an efficiency perspective, but, but, but as part of the bringing it together. The team is suggesting that we do take the opportunity to reduce that. So just to be very clear through through you, Chair, and to the CEO, but as a result of this initiative, we would be spending $46,000 less on sport and recreation grants. Yeah. Not necessarily. It depends on the quantum, because it's a total. It's am amalgamating two grant programs into one. Okay. All right. But I, okay. Um, can I just ask as well, what's the difference between an outcome and what what people do? That that's not quite that clear to me. I think you made that that distinction. What, what do you what do you mean by that through you, Chair? Uh, through the chair. So currently, uh, organisations apply to um, run a program or an event. So that's currently what they apply for. So that's focused on what they're doing. Um, so in the future, we're hoping that organisations will apply more around what outcome they'll be delivering. So does your event focus on inclusivity or is it focused on participation? So really trying to get to the bottom of what the outcome is for the community. Um, and that will assist in, at the moment, uh, for example, in the sport and rec program, they might run an event which increases participation. Um, but at the same time, the community development program might run um, a similar program that also increases participation. So really, um, at the moment, organisations could apply in both of them um, for essentially the same thing. Okay. And um, again, through you, Chair, where would the quick response grants uh, sit within this? Would there still be scope for quick um, response grants? Uh, through the Chair, they're included, so they remain the same. Okay, so the, the, there would still be the opportunity for someone, if they wanted to do something specific, that they could uh, still do that. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess my, my main concern um, with this, not wanting to um, enter into the realm of debate, just um, giving general feedback, um, my uh, concern is, you know, that it is potentially going to reduce the amount of money that's being made available. Uh, you know, I, I take the point that it may well be that there's more um, that's allocated, but it, it sounds like this 
uh, certainly the financial considerations are playing a key role here. Um, and I, I'm just concerned that some organisations may not get the same amount of funding that they've had previously. Um, if I've misunderstood that, I'm open to being um, convinced. Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm addressing through you, but is it okay for me just to talk to the people who are most to likely to, to answer? <laughs> no, just respect the tender. Um, in respect of the amalgamation of two previously separate grant programs, my first hand experience in public administration has been that that can lead to distortions in the sectorial subsector benefit uh, and therefore I would be quite uncomfortable about seeing that. My second, that's a statement, my second question uh, relates, my, my question uh, relates to the, relate, the, the program related cost of delivery as distinct from the amount of funding dispensed. Um, has there been at the same time as the potential for a $46,000 net reduction in the amount of funding provisioned. Has there been a corresponding efficiency dividend yield from the cost of delivering and administering those grant programs in the, in the proposed redesign? Yep. Do you want to answer that? Through the chair. And um, so not as a result of this um, report or discussion. Um, follow, up, uh, follow up question if I might then chair. Um, as a result of the uh, efficiency drive throughout the organisation, what has been uh, the impact on the cost of administering these programs? Yeah. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, my, from memory, um, we've had um, various resources across the organisation deliver multiple grants. So the first efficiency that we did was invest in a system called Smarter Grants to actually capture. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So that's currently underway. In terms of resourcing, um, I thought we'd actually created um, a new role within the structure to manage Smarter Grants and therefore manage. Um, more efficiently um, the associated work around um, uh, you know, the advertising, going through the review processes, putting panels together, making sure the acquittals are done. So we've actually created a role to deliver on our ground commitments. Um, but I'd need to just double check that, but I'm pretty sure. Thank, right? thank, you, Chair, um, and thank you, um, Acting CEO and, and Chair through you. Um, rest assured, I'm, I, I accept and applaud any efforts that are being made toward reducing the administrative cost of delivering X and Y amounts of, of, of public outcomes, no, 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 which hunt there at all. Um, what I, what I am uh, also particularly interested in is the extent to which the the proposed uh, move to I'm jumping forward a little, but since I've got the got the microphone, um, the uh, notion of including community infrastructure within uh, as being eligible to be applied for within uh, programs that have previously been about uh, grant programs that have previously been about programmatic deliveries um, I have been down this road uh, before and uh, it becomes it comes to the diminution of uh, in, in infrastructure wins and programs lose. So I would, I would be personally expressing some feedback, um, not debating, but expressing some feedback. Um, it has in the past, in other situations, led to a diminution in the, uh, uh, the actual programmatic outcomes for community. I just absolutely, in saying that, understand the pressure uh, for infrastructure and community infrastructure is just as big a challenge as as, as other forms of, of public infrastructure. Thank you. Councillor Moran? Yes, I agree with the infrastructure. It's always much more attractive than uh, programs. Uh, could I ask through you, Chair, will this uh, mean there are job losses in the organisation when you amalgamate to um, no job losses? No, no at all? Not at all? Okay. That is, is what's driving this, is it a 
that, that you won't have double dipping. You were saying that you know you might have the same one outcome for this, it's the same outcome. So is this to reduce duplication, is it? And through the chair, yes, and to better realign the grants program to council strategic plan. So um, there was that's to reduce duplication and also to align it better to council's um, objectives, so that that way we can ensure that the grants program is enacting council's objectives. Right. Okay. So we've got examples of that, have we? That where where people have applied and got grants from both. So that would be cutting that out. Is the is the forty seven thousand dollars this? Is that because the sport and rec does doesn't proceed with some of the grant allocations? So that's unspent money. That's that's correct. Is, uh, so, yeah, from memory, there's often underspent just in that yeah program. But I can get the team to explain. My understanding was that was where so the you're, you're, community developments mm -hmm. always spend. Okay, so that that is saying if there's unspent money in um, the sport and recreation grants. That now, because it's together, can go into the community yeah. grants. Yeah. Could we not do that without doing this? Because in my experience, too, when we do blend them, they become a, a smaller pot. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're doing that now or anything, but over time, you know, you've got two sources of um, grants. You make it one source of grant. You tend to then it just takes up one page in the budget rather than two. So I'm not. I, I need a bit more convincing that there's enough double dipping to make it worthwhile. And I need some convincing that the unspent money in sport and rec couldn't be just redirected. It can't. Um, I think. Okay. Uh, through the chair. Um, just to clarify, the, the, the double dipping or the unspent funds wasn't driving the decision to um, to realign the grants programs. It really is um, through council's um, strategic plan and also through the wellbeing dashboard. Um, we're looking to really align the outcomes that when we looked at both programs, they were delivering very similar outcomes to the community, whether that was through a program or an event. Or, or another initiative, they really were very similar. Um, when you looked at the types of organisations that were applying, were often applying to both programs as well. So it really wasn't the unspent funds necessarily that drove <laughs> the decision. Um, were they getting a grant from each uh, grant, uh, grant uh, fund? Uh, CEO is on the team Sorry, I should just also remind, thank you, Chair, remind members that um, our grants program was reviewed through our um, internal audit program, and this was one of the recommendations. So um, not only did Council ask us to do this work, um, our internal audit um, program um, through our um, audit committee also recommended that we review. So um, we haven't just, you know, plucked this out of thin air and decided to, to bring it in the Council. Could you could make it easier for me to make a decision? Could, could you cite some absolute examples of, of what you're, not now, but just, you know, actual, actual examples of, of what's been wrong with the, and how this would improve the situation. I'm certainly not being against it, but it, it is a little bit alarming when we are trying to save money and then suddenly we're amalgamating things. But um, so I'm not against. I just need a better picture, an absolute example where this scheme would be better than that's the old scheme. Acting CEO, you just said it. To Thank me. you. So through, through the presiding member, that's a great idea, Councillor Moran. I think what we could do is perhaps show um, under our existing grants program, if we don't review it, the type of outcomes or the type of that would be um, very helpful, so yeah, yeah projects that get delivered, and then under this one, what we hope to see. Get delivered, yeah. and invariably, you know, I can't see too much change in terms of the recipients. But what we were hoping to do, is, as the paper outlines, is have greater impact. Um, but we can certainly, I think, the next um, round of uh, reporting back into council will show that for you. Council Sims. Thanks. So just to kind of understand the the rationale and. Um, Sorry, is everything okay? Sorry, I'm just going to order. Oh, right, right no problems. Um, just, just so that I can really understand the rationale behind this. So have any of the applicants of the um, Community Development and Recreation and Sport Grants, have they come to council saying, you know, look at this? Or is it being purely driven just by council's own I think it was, it was a recommendation that was brought through. It's, I think it's in the papers, is that correct, CEO? So it was a councillor resolution. It, and also audit committee. Uh, but I'll let you explain, Acting CEO. 
Uh, thank you. Slide two is really clear. Uh, there was a council resolution that future funding commitments to be subject to a review of guidelines to be brought to council by the end of quarter one. So we're a bit, bit behind, sorry, councillor, on that one. And secondly, the KPMG internal audit reporting specifically asked that we review these guidelines in particular. Ah, that's right. And I, I think from memory, there was a, that was when we were cutting, the, when the council cut the community grants. Um, uh, thank you very year. much, Councillor uh, Sims. So, Sorry, just to be clear on that, um, it was around the length of time, wasn't it, for um, those partnerships and grants as opposed to cutting the grants themselves. It was so around I've, three years to one. Yeah, some, that's, that's right. right. So they were getting less money over Cal a three year Councillor period. Councillor Sims, um, but, 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 um, but, Sims, can I just, sorry, interrupt. Lord Lord Mayor is, um, needs to leave it at about six o'clock. Can I just oh, I'll be you... very quick. Okay. Be, yeah, um, I'll be very quick. Just to simply say, and um, I guess what concerns me about this is that it, it seems it hasn't been driven by the um, the applicants. Uh, it's being driven purely by a resolution of, of council, which I think looks like it's been done without consultation with the relevant parties. So I'm a bit concerned about that and, and the implications of that going forward. I think if we're looking at these sorts of things and doing a review, we should be engaging with um, the, the relevant stakeholders um, and hearing from them rather than just looking at a council resolution. Um, can, uh, sorry, Mayor, but uh, did you want to say I did to just that? want to say absolutely. And so the, the next step is to engage with the recipients and community and stakeholders council. As so we just to rest assure you as that we always we do. Board, yeah. As thank we you. always do, Councillor Sims. Uh, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, also, uh, perhaps it would be helpful if the internal audit report was circulated from KPMG because um, that was part of the audit program, the internal audit program that we always had, and this was one of the things that uh, was looked at through that. Um, in terms of the questions you're asking, I'm uh, really pleased that it's gone from outputs to impacts. Um, I know that they're doing that globally in terms of, you know, rather than saying we did 50 of those and, you know, what was what was the change that happened because we held 50 workshops, it's, it's, um, it's a really good way to look at the outcomes that we want for the city. Um, I understand the hesitation between putting sport and rec together with community, but I think if we have some clear demonstrations, that would be uh, really good. And part of it is so that we can actually look at the impacts across both of those programs. So uh, I am comfortable with that. Um, in terms of the strategic partnerships, I think uh, allowing there to be some funding for community impact in terms of strategic partnerships, as we've already done around the Adelaide Zero projects and a few others, um, will allow us to do multi-year support for initiatives, which I think will be um, very helpful, particularly um, talking to the strategic plan. Um, in terms of grants value, there's obviously um, some concern around the reduction in the amount. Um, I'm, I also am very happy not to see a reduction in the amount, but it really goes to see if there's full uptake in those uh, community impact grants. Um, so we'll go back to the examples and um, I think that will uh, answer that in terms of there being a um, any decrease in the value, given it's not a, a budget saving, it's really about streamlining a process and streamlining the outcomes. Um, that might be self-evident when we see some of those examples. Um, and I don't, uh, also uh, like Councillor Ann and Councillor Mackey, I, I don't support a proposal that, um, or my view is, that I wouldn't like to see community infrastructure enhancements as part of that grant process. Um, I think we have a whole stream of work that goes around community infrastructure asset and renewal programs of which we put in millions and millions and millions of dollars on an annual basis. And I'd hate to see that our impact grants are taken up in infrastructure rather than actual community uh, work and community impact. So, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a question for the CEO first. Um, am I to understand that the KPMG uh, audit proposed that the guidelines be reviewed for the whole program, including community and sport and rec recreation grants program be reviewed? Was it the guidelines or the entire programs? Yeah. 
through the presiding member, you're testing my memory, but I thought it was in, um, specifically in relation to community grants. Um, but I would need to take that on notice and just double check because the review was across our grants program for the specific recommendation from memory just for community development. Okay. But I'd need to just double check that. And is this, and I'm asking this sincerely, is this the same two programs where there was a, a majority move on council to uncouple the three year funding? and bring all programs to an end at 2021. So that no more three year programs, that's correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, look, I'm asking my questions through the chair and I want to ask the administration if they can tell us what, um, what programs, a few examples, are community development grants that are being uh, financed in the current financial year? Uh, through the chair, um, there's quite a few. So there's. Um, That's the chair. Um, yes. I've got the. I do have the list here. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so just to give some context, um, there was 14. So with community development this year, there was 14 majors, um, 12 minors. Um, 12 minor and quick response, so 26 in total for community mm. development. Um, and then Sport and Rec, there were seven program and events and 10 quick responses, 17. So we're talking about 43 D programs. Different programs, but among the major ones in community development grants are things like Baptist Care, Adelaide Day Care Centre for Men, right. Aboriginal Sobriety Bus, mm. Angler Care. <laughs> that, they're the ones, okay, good. Um, can we have some of the recipients for the sport and recreation groups? Was one of those uh, three-year funding for SOPO with an emphasis on uh, cultural inclusivity, encouraging young people from culturally diverse backgrounds to play football? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, look, I would like to make some comments. Um, look, I think this is. Um, uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, amalgamation. Um, I, I, I am not aware that the audit actually proposed that the program be reassessed, uh, simply the guidelines. And these are community organisations who are delivering strong outcomes for the city to be contemplating as we are um, destroying this program to replace it with another with, uh, according to page nine, fairly nebulous outcomes when we have clear outcomes for the city delivered by these programs that are in keeping with our strategic plan, particularly the uh, community and uh, uh, rather the sport and recreation grants, um, which you know our own website says are consistent um, with our strategic goals, um, which um, uh, include the 2013-23 um, uh, strategic plan um, for uh, health and well-being, when we already have programs that are delivering uh, outcomes, good outcomes for the city's homeless, good outcomes for uh, people who are hungry in this city, and we're now talking about replacing all of those um, with a new program that has um, a, a very narrow focus in, a, in as much as the majority of the funds is proposed here, um, will go to six projects of $50,000, six impact streams. Is there some feedback here, Councillor Martin? Sorry. This is, this is feedback. This is feedback. This is feedback. Right. I'm telling you what I think, Chair. Just, 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 just. No, that's all right. But look, uh, uh, you know, feedback is about telling you what you think, not what you want to hear. So I'm saying, I am saying to the administration, um, this is dynamite. Uh, don't start um, fiddling with groups that are delivering great outcomes for the city um, just for some nebulous program that's going to deliver outcomes for welcoming, participation, reconciliation, social inclusion, neighbourhood connection, community infrastructure through some impactful scheme. Um, I, I would like to see uh, a much uh, more measured approach to this. You know, these are, these are organisations who are making outstanding contributions to this community 
um, we should not be trying to uh, impact what they're doing um, by um, a community impact grant a scheme that may well end up causing more harm than it does good. Councillor Mackey. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I absolutely understand and and to a very, very greatest extent support the Lord Mayor's uh, um, contribution uh, this earlier about the shift in grant making uh, uh, policy and guidelines toward impact. What I do want to do though is, is clarify for everybody's benefit, uh, particularly those who may be less familiar with um, uh, community grant programs in three tiers of government. Um, less money cannot deliver more impact. A different framing of the ask and, and uh, a set of different set of KPIs can report more effectively on impact, but I've never seen a grant program in 25 years in, uh, in this space uh, that has seen more delivered for less value uh, of a grant program because we know those grant programs have never ever kept up with the cost of inflation uh, and they've never ever kept up with the real cost of service delivery so i, I add that as a piece of feedback councillor sims just to add to uh, my feedback um, i think we really should be looking at how we can increase um, funding for um, these sorts of organizations uh, I'm very concerned that we're kind of asking people to do more for less. I mean, I don't think that's realistic, um, particularly in, I don't in the think middle that's of. A suggestion, particularly. Well, well. No, I don't think there's <laughs> anything do... in the quick key questions there that suggest that. Or potentially. Uh, and I don't think that's the intent here. I'm not. I'm uh, sorry, I'm, chair. I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just giving my feet. Yes, giving my. <laughs> giving my. I'm, feet feet the <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. saying that let's be clear that's about the intent the here. Right. And that, that's not the intention of what tonight's workshop is about. And I don't want it to be reported in that way. So I need to be clear in the direction and where we're going here. Well, my feedback is I am concerned about this approach and, and the implications that it would have um, for organisations that rely on um, this funding. That's fair. Okay. Councillor Gnoll. So just, just to, I suppose, uh, reiterate, I suppose, the question. So. Um, the, the, this money that we're talking about, forty-six thousand dollars, is because of the uh, sports recreation uh, grants were not filled to that uh, to that to the full extent of what was available, and it's just transferring that which we are using across to the combined uh, fund um, and, and using those figures. Is that correct? Sorry, that's just through the chair. Um, no, that's not the sole reason um, for the proposal. So um, to give some context, in 1920, the combined value of both programs was 665,000. In 2021, it was 734,000. So that's this year. So this proposal was looking at 700,000, but it wasn't to drive any efficiencies through budget necessarily. It was to drive efficiencies through the delivery of the programs and to avoid duplication across both programs. So this is this enable by putting them together enables your flexibility to go across the various aspects of the, of the grant applications to enable them us to get better value or better coverage for the uh, um, you know for the monies that we're that's all right. for, the, for the monies that uh, are available. So it just allows us to get greater flexibility across uh, all of the uh, uh, various uh, Uses. Through the chair, yes, that was the intent. Okay. Now, with the, um, we obviously have this $200,000, which is a conversation piece. Um, how how would this be structured so that, um, you know, if this was going to be an aspect of it, that it, it, it gets a, a, a balanced rate uh, weighting uh, in regards to how we do things? Um, you know, so if we're going to give monies out, then how are you going, how do we rate, the, how will we? You know, put guidelines together to ensure that we're, you know, we're delivering a, something that is going to be as impactful as a variety of the others, because obviously we're dealing with much larger sums and enabling people to, to be more ambitious with their activities. 
So through the chair, community infrastructure is already a grant category in the sport and recreation program. So um, for example, um, one of the grants was for approximately, I think 25,000, yes, 25,000. Um, and that was for things like irrigation. So when we talk about community infrastructure, it's not always about um, buildings, for example. So it could be lighting, um, improvements to playing fields or, you know, some building um, work. So um, the inclusion of it in there would actually um, reduce it to a maximum of 25,000. So um, that's the intent. Um, those larger projects that are referenced, the opportunity would be to include those in the strategic partnerships um, where there would be an opportunity then to leverage um, council's input with um, the input of others. So for example, our input could be used for seed funding, which then went to state government to match, which then went you know, to provide um, you know, funding towards a much bigger project. So that was the intent. So that's already available now, it's just that it's, it's now being pulled together and together all of this as well. So you just basically plugged it all into one and you're now going to uh, have the guidelines and everything like that and, and the assessments so that it still it still speaks to this, but um, but it's, it's done in a holistic way rather than lots of little fractured uh, buckets. So through the chair, community infrastructure isn't available through the community developments um, program at the moment, only sport and rec. So this would actually provide more opportunities for community groups to be able to apply for community infrastructure grants, which they can't currently do. So that's all the questions about at the moment. Just be mindful, Councillor Kanon, through the chair. Uh, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got one quick question just about that KPMG report. Um, so here it says the, KP, the KPMG report um, uh, findings and recommendations specifically directed the community development grant guidelines should be reviewed. So, what would have happened if we hadn't taken that, uh, that on and um, uh, if, we hadn't, if we hadn't done that, so what would be the outcomes of that? Um, I can see it. Yeah. Did you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so all our um, internal audit recommendations are monitored, um, and we action them and we report on them. So um, we do have discussions regularly with our um, audit committee around progress against those um, recommendations. So I mean, no one would go, you know, would lose their life if this wasn't done, but it's poor management and poor business practice to ignore um, recommendations from um, internal audit. Yeah, so so we would be reporting back to say, we, you know, we haven't done this piece of work um, because we've run out of time or we just haven't prioritised it. And that's not normally how we approach mm -hmm. So through the chair, that's just doing our due diligence. Um, through the chair, it's not just due diligence, as Amy, Amy has said, we have um, taken the opportunity to look at our grants program on the back of um, smart grants and how we're approaching um, uh, funding for groups. And also just to modernise, it's been a while since our um, guidelines have been reviewed. Um, I think Councillor Martin, you encouraged us to review our sport and rec guidelines a couple of years ago, so thank you, we reviewed those at that time. Um, it's timely, good practice to, to review and look at, um, you know, are there better ways to, to do what we do? And that was the intent of, of this generally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I just have a question. Did you have my oh, yeah, go on. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ho. All right, next item 4.2, Chester Street proposal. Matthew Morrissey, I believe you're outside. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, um, Matthew, and we have David here in regards to the proposal as well. So would you like to introduce the item? Thank you, and through the chair. So um, as noted, I have David Barone here from Jensen uh, Past Planning. who uh, will take us through the vision of the proposal uh, tonight. Um, the purpose of tonight is City of Adelaide has received a, a street upgrade proposal. Um, the proposal is for the third party consortium, which consists of Chester Properties and Wing IPG uh, Adelaide uh, to upgrade the northern end of Chester Street uh, between Grenville Street and French Street at their cost. So the reason for the workshop tonight is a closure of that particular section of road would trigger a section 32, uh, which is a change of uh, road use. Um, So the questions that we have uh, proposed tonight is we're seeking uh, council members' views on two key questions, which is uh, views on the proposal and views on the change in the road use. Uh, I'll now hand over to David to run through the detail of the proposal. Thank you, members. It's a pleasure to present to you and thank you for the opportunity to present this proposal uh, to you. Um, so the proposal is largely driven by Chester Property. Um, who are the owners of uh, 95 Grenfell Street, which is the, uh, the right hand or eastern side of Chester Street. Um, their major tenant is Consumer and Business Services. And this project is being driven principally by a review of uh, that particular tenant for their operational needs, um, looking to potentially expand and improve the range of services that they provide. Uh, and that includes moving more services to the ground floor. And as a result of that, they have a strong desire to actually reorient their entry onto Chester Street, uh, which we think is fantastic. Um, and that's driven a desire to actually improve the space and, and the functionality of the space in front of that entry point. Uh, Wing IPG is the owner of 77 Grenfell Street, which is on the western side of Chester Street. Um, both of those owners and both of those buildings have frontage for the full length of uh, the subject, uh, the street subject to this uh, proposal. Um, Wind up have been involved in discussions uh, with Chester Properties and are supportive of the proposal. Um, they see there's an opportunity to potentially reposition their building, uh, in particular enhancing the ground floor and the way that that interacts with the street. Um, this is a unique situation. I would imagine councils don't very often get proposals by private landowners to redevelop um, at their own cost public realm. Um, it's an opportunity that's arisen because of the timing uh, of negotiations, um, but because of that timing is also of importance. Um, both parties are eager to commence the Section 32 process so that um, they can continue with the uh, their commercial arrangements with um, both tenants or tenants moving forward. Um, I presume that my members are fairly familiar with Chester Street, so I'll gloss over the existing conditions. The key points I'd like to highlight from the photographs are that the street is narrow, footpaths themselves are very narrow, less than a metre. Um, there are bollards at the Grenfell Street end, and they were put in place uh, in response to the bike, uh, bus lane that was put in. Uh, along uh, Grenfell Street. Uh, there are currently four loading spaces um, and the only way to access the loading spaces is actually to reverse down Chester Street from the French Street Junction. Um, the, there are existing, uh, so that obviously creates conflicts with pedestrians who are walking uh, from uh, Grenfell Street through to Perry Street, which is a, a key connection in the city. 
The existing arbors uh, were installed in the early 90s. Um, they are suffering from corrosion and are identified as having a limited lifespan. Um, and some initial work that's been done has identified that replacement of those is actually more cost effective than uh, any remediation works there. Um, you've got existing vines, which are mostly at the northern end of the street, um, which create a, an attractive environment. Um, and actually, depending on what time you go at night, uh, abundance with bird life as well. There's quite a lot of birds that uh, live in those spaces. Um, and there's existing uh, stormwater infrastructure for the street, which will need to be integrated into any uh, proposal that's put forward. Um, you can see that bottom middle photograph has a glass entry, which uh, was a previous entry for that building. Um, they've uh, turned their back to the space, which I think is a missed opportunity. Um, and you can see that a lot of the, the facades also have glazed entries and, and doorways, which um, lends itself well to uh, better utilisation. So the proposal uh, is uh, an initial concept, and this has been developed collaboratively uh, with council's administration. Um, so I might just you can use the contrary on this. I might just point out the fit out itself for Chester Place would involve the relocation of the chapel, which is currently on the second floor, I believe, into the bottom corner, um, along with a new lobby space, reception and entry area for uh, CBS, as we, as we term them. Um, a new entry space for that, which will connect into the foyer that is currently in place for the whole building. Um, and then offices for uh, staff as well as um, end of journey facilities on the ground floor as well. Um, and so the proposal itself is seeking to uh, place bollards at the French Street end and pedestrianise that section of the street. Uh, now the bollards themselves will be removable bollards so that they will allow um, temporary uh, access for vehicles for maintenance and, and uh, emergency purposes and, and that nature. Um, the idea being that we would regrade the street, uh, re-establish uh, a new drainage system which is actually able to accommodate a larger drainage flow, uh, event flows as well uh, into a space that has no curves, flat uh, and is easily accessible. Um, the proposal also includes uh, the uh, replacement of the arbors, uh, like for like, uh, with the, within the existing structures of, of the buildings. Um, two benefits for that. One is um, we actually get to, as much as possible, maintain the vines that are in place, which is um, such an asset for that part of the street, but also means that you know, you've got something there that uh, creates a amenity from the beginning. Uh, and then the other element to that is it actually avoids the need to uh, place structures, supporting structures in the street itself, um, and it's also a cheaper solution. Um, and obviously the stormwater infrastructure will be reconfigured to a central drain, and then that will then connect into to Greenville Street. So uh, a key component of this is the opportunity to uh, better activate the street with facades. Uh, it's an incentive for both building owners and tenants to actually utilise an entry into the street. Certainly CBS um, as a major tenant for that building will, will have a, an entry and that will drive people to the street in that location. There's opportunities for outdoor dining um, as well as opportunities for, for the types of venues that would increase activity into the evening hours, after hours and then, and then also an opportunity for uh, use of that space for events into the future as well. Um, so why is this a good thing? I've sort of touched on some of these already, but uh, effectively what it does is it creates a new and improved space for pedestrians, um, removing in particular the conflict with vehicles who are loading in that particular location. Um, it creates a space that uh, is better suited to um, all types of users of the street, um, people with disabilities and, and uh, the like. Uh, it increases the activation of the space uh, and I think an important point to make is that with the relocation and redevelopment of the consumer business services, that will actually result in increase in uh, events and activities in the space. This year alone, they're proposing an, uh, an additional 200 weddings to occur there. Um, with the new facilities anticipated that that would increase even more. At the moment, the two buildings themselves attract uh, around 10,000 visitors, um, and so that will have increased capacity to grow. Um, 
about 2,700 workers in that particular space. Um, and they need a destination to go to, and this actually uh, will provide a significantly improved space for them, um, which is important at a time when we're looking to try and get uh, workers back into the city. Um, we've had a look at the, the manner in which the council strategic documents uh, aligns with the proposal. We've, we've done a bit of an assessment of that. This particular location is within an identified core primary pedestrian area within council's development plans. It's identified as a key link. Um, and uh, so the proposal that will improve pedestrian connectivity and that space will support those particular objectives. Um, we've also uh, designed the concepts to actually be able to accommodate uh, outdoor dining and maintain uh, council's outdoor dining guidelines requirements in terms of separation from uh, movement through for pedestrians as well. Um, and then the other thing um, to point out is this, this has the potential to create a destination, um, has the potential to have uh, uh, additional uh, effects uh, or benefits to other properties within the street as, as there is a cluster of activity in that particular location um, and uh, it supports previous investment that councils uh, had in terms of upgrades to other streets and laneways. Uh, as part of the development of the concept and the background investigations we've also engaged with Brown Falconer who are one of the other key landowners along the street um, and we've uh, received a letter from them in full support of the proposal as well. So three of the key landowners uh, are on board. Uh, so uh, finally, this is a, a effectively a public realm upgrade um, at no cost to council. Um, there's an indicative uh, estimate of about $340,000 for the costs that has been prepared by RLB for um, the owner uh, based on an initial concept. Um, and so um, that will obviously be refined as part of the, the next phase of the process of detailed design. But I'll leave it to Matt to talk to the next steps. Thank you, David. So uh, next steps from here would be, uh, we would undertake a 30 day consultation period under the section 32 Roads Traffic Act. Uh, we would present uh, that consultation pack back to council uh, for a decision and pending a council's decision, we'd then take it through to a deed of agreement uh, with the uh, consortium uh, to take it through to construction delivery. So I'll now hand back to council for any comments. Councillor Kerr. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, I think that this is a very attractive uh, proposal. Um, I think that uh, Chester Street is eminently suited um, to this type of pedestrianisation. Um, I also think that what we want to be uh, completely assured of uh, is that uh, any detriment to businesses uh, in and around Chester Street that result uh, from the loss of the loading zones uh, is fully uh, accounted for uh, and is uh, mitigated uh, as far as possible, in particular uh, through the generation of new loading zones uh, in the vicinity uh, and if we as councillors can be sure that that has happened um, that would be a great step in making this basically a no-brainer. Um, I say this with a bit of an overarching um, view that um, this sort of activation is clearly welcome but we must be mindful uh, that the economy in the city of Adelaide is not just hospitality uh, and there can tend to be sometimes a bit of a focus on hospitality uh, with respect to the words outdoor dining in particular. Um, and I think there is a valid perception that sometimes retail uh, and other uh, forms of businesses don't get, uh, get as much of a look in. So I think to quell any of those concerns, we really have to make sure that uh, the, the, the businesses are, are properly uh, catered to in that respect. Can I just ask um, members, just um, when someone's talking, you can just not have conversations happening because it's just a little bit distracting. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I've got a list happening, Councillor Mackey, so not on my list, but I have Councillor Mackey today. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of uh, couple of comments. Um, uh, some of those renders that I saw kind of reminds me of the Riverbank to, to Market um, initiative. So uh, Big, uh, big fan of that initiative, and I think if we can do this here in Chester Street, hopefully that will be a catalyst for uh, for that precinct 
to, uh, um, to to take off. Who knows? Um, some of the other uh, uh, um, uh, uh, streets might actually look at um, uh, what's happened here and then might um, uh, decide to follow or do a similar sort of thing. But um, uh, in terms of, um, I, I do have one quick question. In terms of the timelines for you, Chair um, Matthew, you sort of mentioned that we'll, we'll go out to consultation and then from there on we can sort of um, um, uh, get the project moving. So, uh, uh, do we have a, um, a timeline from there on uh, in terms of when it will likely start and how long it will take, roughly? I thank you and through the chair. So, the consultation we can commence effectively after this meeting. Um, uh, the council resolution component of this is in regard to the section 32, which is the actual road closure. So we can effectively go out for consultation um, tomorrow. Um, the uh, publication is actually currently identified to go out in the paper on Friday. Uh, so we'll commence the uh, consultation process. That'll be 30 days uh, and post that, we'll bring it back into the chamber, potentially through committee and council, get endorsement of that, then we'll go into negotiation with the developer around um, funding and the deed of agreement. Um, generally, generally, those sort of agreements take about two to three months to formalise and then we can get into the construction or they can get into the construction site. Thank you. Through the chair, just a follow-up question. So do we know roughly how long that, that construction is going to take? And the reason I'm asking is, Obviously, we're going into the winter period, so it'll be great to, um, uh, to push things through and you know, get that up and running for the, uh, the upcoming um, uh, summer when the precinct can come alive. So, uh, Through the chair, the timing of that will be dependent on signing of the deed of agreement and uh, obviously mobilisation of construction. Uh, but I dare say that it will be constructed during the summer period in order to avoid the stormwater issues associated with construction. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, two uh, answers to two questions. A, a, a brief comment and a, and a question, if I might. Um, views on the proposal, double plus good. Um, views on the change in road use, I, would be supportive of that going through the process that uh, needs to be undertaken. My um, question, uh, well, firstly, my, my comment to congratulate uh, the interest, the owners who are joining, and also um, Jensen Plus for um, very, very good work uh, in, in terms of public place making. This will be transformative to Chester Street. The question um, through you, Chair, um, to our administration is. If this were to have been a project that was instigated and promulgated and procured through council, what might the difference in price have been to the cost of the project? Because the, the, the price estimated, uh, and I have no doubt that that is correct, is extraordinarily good value compared to the kind of cost of delivering uh, public realm improvements uh, um, by by a, a tier of government. Um, through you, Chair, it's, that's a really good question. Um, Happy to take it on notice. I'm not sure we can answer it tonight, but certainly um, uh, working with private investors um, enables um, definitely some economies of scale and, and the ability to deliver works um, pretty efficiently. So I'll, I'll come back to you on that council if you like, but um, uh, currently we hadn't um, costed or envisaged any um, new and significant upgrade in that area, so we have to do a little bit of work to understand what that would cost. Appreciate it. Don't, mm -hmm. Through you, Chair, thanks, Clinton. Don't, don't spend hours um, yep. uh, in, in pursuit of that. It's slightly rhetorical, but I think we all know that the slightly realistic answer would be rather more than the 340000 um, so, uh, again, this is a great example of how local stakeholders, in concert with, and I absolutely commend Jensen Plus for uh, engaging with, with our administration uh, to, to conceive and see delivered something that would not have come up, percolated up to a priority at this point, but it will have manifestly significant benefits for uh, public amenity. Councillor Martin, if you don't mind, can I just refer to the Lord Mayor because she has to leave? Is that that one? You're all right? You're okay? Okay, sorry, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, 
a couple of um, basic questions about the project through the chair. Um, um, is it proposed that this is to be a 24 hour road closure with no movement at all, as in uh, Bank Street and others where tra traffic flow is possible? Uh, through the chair, the proposal is to close uh, the road. Uh, it will remain a public road, but it will be closed to through traffic uh, for 24 7 uh, and only open to emergency services. Okay, and do we know what um, patterns of usage there are? Do we have any statistics about how many vehicles use it for what purpose? Uh, through the chair, the uh, current use of that uh, section of uh, road is to maintain four loading zones, uh, which, as stated previously, uh, vehicles have to back into, which is contraflow and causes uh, pedestrian safety issues and sort of, I suppose, in some way goes against uh, the shared use um, zone that we've now created in there. So this complements that uh, quite well. Um, the current use of that is four loading zones. Uh, within the current area, there's about 30 other loading zones within 50 to 100 metres of um, this particular site. So we don't see any uh, huge impact on loading. Uh, for that area. The only other use within this area is obviously pick up and drop off for the two adjacent buildings that are actually part of this consortium, uh, which is by and large the majority use of that, that shared zone. So again, don't see any uh, major issues associated with the removal of those four spaces. And um, the illustrations show in the foreground and the background, lots of glass with people coming out with food, uh, cups, plates and so on. Is it the intention of the building owners to um, create hospitality venues on that site where there are currently none? I think uh, at this point in time, they're shown as, as concepts, as an, as an indicative of what can be established there. I think it will depend on interest from uh, potential tenants. And I think getting the mix right um, along in terms of the types of businesses and who, who runs it is really important for the space, um, but that's, subject to further uh, development applications and, and permits as well. So it, it, that's not, not set in concrete, but the intention is to create facades onto that area. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, at, at the moment, the buildings do have uh, regular window plane frontage, um, yeah. which would make it very easy for that to, to be converted to doors and things like that. So sure. um, sort of hole in the wall type tenancies would be quite easy to, to establish there. Uh, and I'm uh, confused about the vines because our papers say the vines are going. You th think you might be able to retain them or retain some of them? Through the chair, yeah. The intent is to, as much as possible, uh, retain the vines if we can. There may need to be some trimming depending on how they've grown around the arbors to be able to get them in and out. Um, but yeah, certainly the intent is to retain them. We, we recognise they're an asset. And so if they are not retained, there'll be more vines, not. You know, yeah, I mean, we would work with the administration, but the intent would be to, to cover the space with additional vines. Yep. Um, and uh, given the area is going to be closed constantly and used potentially for catering or whatever, um, who, who's responsible for the upkeep and cleaning? The council or the, uh, the parties who are putting this proposal? Uh, through the chair, that as stated, the uh, road will remain public, so it would be uh, council's responsibility to maintain that area. Obviously, uh, through an event or a permit, um, the maintenance or the associated um, cleanliness would be associated with that permit, but uh, by and large, the majority of the maintenance would be council's. Okay, and I didn't see anything about leases or payments or whatever, so it's proposed that um, there will be no fee associated with it but the costs will revert to council, that is cleaning, maintaining, uh, ensuring that the asset stays in the condition that it's constructed. Through the chair, yes, the development agreement that would be put in place post this should it be successful will identify the uh, agreement in how the works will proceed, the whole points um, and the practical completion and also the vesting over of the assets at the end of uh, the works.
And can I ask the administration, what is the policy? Just one moment, sorry, Councillor Martin, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's just uh, just asking members to be respectful. Councillor Martin is asking questions, so we need to you give him that respect. I'm happy with this. I'm, as a chair, I'm, I'm making I'm the call. I think, it's, I think we need to be respectful to the person that's talking. So thank you, Councillor Martin, please continue. Thank you, thank you. And, and seriously, Chair, just disrespect as well. Um, can I ask the administration, what is our policy at, at Council on turning over public roads for private um, purposes such as this? Sorry, which private? So I heard Matt say the Pub road remains public. Uh, well, no, we're uh, turning it into an outdoor dining area, which will be closed 24-7 which will be for the use of people traversing the street, but also for the businesses. And there will be a deed of agreement that says, this is your plot of land for whatever period. What is our policy on such issues? Um, thank you through the presiding member. It's, uh, um, it's in the Local Government Act. It steps through quite clearly, I think, what we can and can't do. Is that my No, but I mean, what's our policy? As a, as a council, because we've had cases before where people have proposed closing roads and turning it into dining areas or whatever. Uh, and my memory is that we've referred to that policy in considering proposals. So I'm just wondering what is that policy? Clinton? Uh, through the chair, I'm, I'm not aware of the policy you're referring to, but if you could point me in the direction, that would be great. But notwithstanding Lee section- Lee Street. Sorry? Lee Street. Notwithstanding section 32 would be the mechanism yeah. for council to approve or otherwise um, the change in use of the road. Yep. Um, that's the, the Local Government Act position, but in terms of our own policies, I, I'd have to check on that for you. Will you just check what we did with Lee Street? Exactly the same. Um, yeah, so through through Lee Street and, and Peel Street, um, it's usually done on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to a council policy. So my, my memory is, is it's case-by-case -case councillor well, as opposed to... should be case-by-case. That's what I think it is, which is because I don't want to have a policy that makes this the norm because we can't afford to do it. We can. I mean, I would prefer that we took your design and we paid for it. But Councillor Moran, we are trying to speak this after Lord Mayor. Have you quite finished? Oh, yes, Councillor Moran. Um, uh, no, look, just one comment. Look, mm -hmm. I, you know, we're, we're absolutely uh, strapped for cash. And so this would represent an additional cost. It would be great, um, and I'm sure the man from Jensen uh, would be delighted to hear me say it would be great if we could come to some arrangement that would assist in maintaining the area. Um, because council is essentially being invited to pass over that asset. I think this is a great idea. Um, uh, uh, let's be clear, I don't think we're passing over the asset. We're entering into a deed of agreement. Well, which we haven't got uh, the information as yet, so um, uh, let's I'm, not throw it out there that we're actually entering over the asset. You're debating, debating me, Chair, uh, and I'm giving you feedback. And and Councillor Martin, I'm actually not debating you. I'm, I'm clarifying what you're saying and it's not correct to say that at this point in time that that's what we are doing. Now, your feedback is noted. Thank you very much. Is there anything further you would like to add? Well, I didn't get a chance to... I'm asking you, is there anything further you would yes, like to add? Yes, I'd like to suggest that if it's possible that we enter into some agreement so that there aren't substantial costs associated with it, um, because maintaining an area of that um, a design would require a great deal more than the, you know, the street sweeping that we currently do. Thank you, noted. Um, um, Matthew, would you like to answer that? Thank you. Through the chair, so the deed of agreement that uh, is being referred to is in regard to the construction of uh, the assets. Uh, in effect, stating that the consortium developer parties will uh, undertake the works to our standard and hand them back over to council as our own assets. It will remain a public road um, and therefore the maintenance of that public road remains 100% council. Thank you. Thank you. I, I understood the we were going to enter into some kind of agreement. So um, can I just ask subsequent to that, uh, Chair, um, is the developer happy to proceed without any kind of agreement from council saying, look, we'll allow you to continue to use that for the next 20 or 30 years we get that undertaken? Without that, <laughs> um, well, I'd have to speak to my client in relation. I'd have to take that on notice because, um, yeah, I'm not too sure what their position would be. Yeah. Thank you, um, Lord Mayor. 
Um, thank you. Um, I actually uh, agree that this is um, fabulous that we're looking at uh, improved spaces and pedestrianising Chester Street. I think it, it is a street that's been begging for some improvement for some time. It also used to be obviously very well known in terms of its restaurants and things like that. So to afford the street to be activated in that way. I'd also like to um, uh, note the CVS activation uh, with weddings and things in the middle of the city, uh, which is a is a fabulous opportunity for us and also a couple of Elvis weddings maybe. But great opportunity to bring life to that area. Um, I'm not sure that you will be able to keep the vines because they, but to replant something very similar um, would be great because those vines are sort of an intrinsic part of how people know Cheshire Street. Um, so in terms of the questions, um, I think the proposal looks great. I would like just some feedback on the materials, um, particularly from a cleaning perspective, as we've had some um, difficulties with some of the materials we've used, such as um, Top and More, which um, as soon as the, the, the project is complete and, and any food is spilled, it, it looks like it's hasn't been cleaned even though it has. So just, you know, that, and that's to do with the porous nature of the materials that were used. So um, so some feedback or some, um, perhaps a little bit more work on the materials that are being used um, would be great. Um, love the brick banding, I think that's excellent. And uh, and in terms of the designs, some great design there. Um, I do actually, um, I think it's an appropriate change of road use. Um, obviously, you have got the support of uh, three of the key owners in the area, um, but uh, the consultation will give us any feedback with any problems. And also uh, noting that Matt talked about the loading zones that are in or around the area and the difficulty with using the backing up from uh, French Street. So, um, thank you. Thank. You. I wish. I wish we had such difficult things to discuss uh, on more occasions. It's an uh, absolute tribute to you and the partners that they would look at investing in the, in the public realm in the city. And we hope there's going to be many more. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, I was just going to ask, I think we answered. So how many um, property owners are there? Is it three out of 20 or three out of four that have signed on? But I'm happy to wait for the consultation. Um, also, so can I just ask through you, Madam Chair, we still have outdoor dining fees, don't we? No, we don't. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, we do have an outdoor dining fee in our fees and charges, um, but it's zero. Yeah. So we do have the, because we still regulate the public space. Yeah. I'm happy to clean. Right, thank you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Canoy. Um, just in regards, like if there was to be outdoor dining and that there, uh, is it norm uh, uh, that there is a certain level of cleaning that they're the actual uh, you know, people who have that outdoor dining facility to clean up the, their area? So, uh, yeah, so through the through the chair, um, that's correct. So as part of um, outdoor dining and regulating public space, there is a permit. So even though there's no charge for it, there are certain conditions through that permit um, that we do still monitor. So I'm just to those couple of comments, yes, I agree with all the positive comments that people have made. And uh, I've seen it, uh, that uh, you know, by the use of the street, it's at least it now it increases the safety and everything like that of that space. Cause, uh, and also people still park in that space after five o'clock. Because you know, it's when it, the loading zone's finished, so it's, it's not, it has no real use afterwards. Yeah, just very quickly, I know there's been a bit of, bit of conversation around the, the vines and the vines uh, being an asset. Um, uh, I walk past Chester Street a fair bit, so I know that uh, the Brand Falconer office, they've got a, uh, um, uh, a green wall that's got more greening on it than the vines there already. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, even, even if we do lose some, some of those vines, yeah, I think the Brand Falconer uh, outfit um, does a perfect job there. Thank you, members. I'd just like to uh, acknowledge and agree with everybody, everyone's comments here, and I'd love to see some public art in that space as well. That's a nice conversation, but thank you very much. Yeah.
Forum. <laughs> Thank you, members. We have started streaming. Um, item 4.3, um, Adelaide Parklands Community Land Management Plan. Thank you, Michelle. Would you like to introduce the item? Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, tonight we're just going to talk to you in relation to the CLF um, general provisions 
and um, a report was presented to Council, if you recall, on the 15th of December last year, um, asking for approval to go out to community consultation on those provisions, um, and Council um, deferred the matter to a workshop to um, seek some further information, and that's specifically in relation to um, lighting, memorials, drones and dog management. So um, we've got a number of questions for you tonight. Um, in addition to those matters, we've also um, proposed um, for Council's um, feedback um, an additional um, provision in relation to signage. So I think what I'll do is I'll take, given the lateness of the hour, I'll take the paper as read um, and just see whether you've got any questions for either myself or Yep, Michelle. Yes, Yeah, Michelle. Anyone's got any questions? All straightforward? Oh. Yeah, I have, and there are a couple of issues. Um, in raising this at council, one of the issues I mentioned was car parking, which is not covered in the papers. Um, it is um, that still part of the proposed template for all CLMPs and yeah. uh, through the chair um, the car parking is uh, one of those um, what we're calling parklands wide policy statements mm -hmm. and that is um, the statement in the draft general provisions is consistent with what's in the um, Adelaide Parklands Management Strategy which is overall to reduce car parking um, on parklands by 5% over the duration of the strategy. But um, basically, um, at the heart of it is to um, avoid any need for car parking on any particular parks um, in the future. So, aiming to reduce. To avoid. To avoid. Okay. Reduce. Oh, good. Yes. I'm happy about that. Okay. Um, look, just in, in terms of feedback in respect of this, um, lighting is a, um, a matter that is a bit controversial. And um, while I understand the intent is to enhance uh, the parklands experience, the, the downsides are that potentially uh, people are put at risk uh, by entering into a lit area which may not be safe. And therefore, my, my support of any uh, lighting policy in regard to parklands would be that it would have to be created in consultation with SAPOL, um, without SAPOL's involvement. Uh, yes, just through yep. the chair, we did um, ask SAPOL to review the revised lighting statement and they've um, given our their support. I, I mean on particular proposals. Uh, if we are, for example, to now light areas, as the document says, in areas adjacent to or near roadways, uh, I would want to know that SAPOL were saying, look, you know, we've had 34 muggings in this area in the past 10 years, not a good idea or you know, on a case-by-case case basis. Yeah, uh, Acting CEO, did you want to add to that? Um, thank you, that's a really good point, Councillor Martin. We do do safety audits with SAPOL in the parklands and that does inform um, those lighting projects as well. So those are done regularly in conjunction with SAPOL, but that's a good point. We can make that maybe clearer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and uh, on uh, the subject of um, um, memorials, um, I want to make um, my, I don't know, it may not be everybody's, and, and that is that I just don't want the parklands to host any more. Um, you know, on the information that's been provided to us, there are about 380 uh, structures or parks in the parklands, and all but 40 of them are devoted to what appear to be memorials. Now, if we keep on remembering this way, um, we're just going to clog up the parklands with more and more parks. And, and so my view is that there should be very, very stringent processes attached to memorials and maybe they don't sit within CLMPs. That, that is to say that there be some process outside of that that very rigorously um, assesses whether in fact we want more memorials or you know, whether in fact, um, and this is just a personal view, we ought to consider whether there ought to be a part of the parklands that would be a memorial park where such things could be uh, placed rather than have them constantly appearing uh, uh, in the parklands. And I might add, 
I had tripped over a memorial the other night in the parklands. It was a park sitting on a piece of concrete, which wasn't lit. Um, and, uh, you know, they are a, a problem. Um, in respect of drones, I, um, I actually don't support the inclusion of recommendations on drones in the parklands. Um, as the administration points out, CASA have rules related to the use of drones. And I think that should be our, our guiding policy um, to add another layer of bureaucracy on top of that, that says, we'll have it here, we'll have it there, but not here. Um, that complicates, in my view, matters further. But particularly it is, and I, I do understand there are all kinds of associated issues, including privacy, but um, drones, particularly associated with photography, is one of the fastest growing areas of um, uh, recreational activity, people taking pictures of riverbanks, trees, whatever. Um, and in respect of dogs, on behalf of uh, dog owners everywhere, um, I think the rule that says in our guidelines that two metres um, is the maximum length for a dog lead is too restrictive. Mm -hmm. oh. Just yeah. Through the chair, can I respond? Yeah. That two metre um, length is specified in the Dog and Cat Management Act. So that's that's how it's defined as a dog being under effective control. Okay. Well, if, yeah. if they're using a lead, a dog can be under effective control if it's under voice command, but if the person is uh, using a lead, it can't exceed two metres. Well, you know, um, if that rule exists already, that's sad, but um, you know, I walk in the parklands and I see um, dogs on leads that are about, you know, anything up to about 15 metres. Um, they are, I'm just, it's an over exaggeration. They are. Very much, five, very much, five, 15 metres. They are considerably longer than two metres. And, and, you know, the dogs love it. Um, that's one of the nice things about our parklands that puppies get to run around still under the control of uh, owners. And in respect of signage, yes, I don't have a problem with this. Anyone else? Okay, Quick question. Um, uh, in terms of drones, do, do we already do something down at Victoria Park with drones? Yes. Is there a park dedicated to drone lovers? Um, there is. Uh, Michelle, do you just want to explain this? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> through the chair. Yes, at the moment, uh, drones and also model aircraft are permitted in a section of um, Park 16, so uh, Victoria Park. And in Park uh, 20, there's an area where um, clubs um, have our um, permission and CASA permission to operate. So that's a, a separate um, licensing arrangement under CASA. Thank you. I think that's all the questions and feedback we have in regards to that. And um, thank you very much. And this concludes our meeting. Um,